Welcome to The Teaching Curve, a podcast exploring the pedagogy of global politics and international relations, produced under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative of the International Studies Association and made available through ISA's Professional Resource Center. I'm Jamie Free, Associate Provost and Professor of Global Politics at Bridgewater College. Each episode of The Teaching Curve is a conversation about the ingredients of effective teaching and learning of international studies. The goal? to celebrate and inspire pedagogical creativity by exploring pedagogical approaches, not as recipes to be followed, but as authorization to use the natural empathy that all academics have with students to build environments in which learning is not just possible, but engaging. Successful teaching is built on such connections. Today's conversation is with Petra Hendrickson and Daisy Lupa. Petra is an assistant professor of political science and Daisy, a newly minted graduate of Northern Michigan University in the United States. Petra has published on student engagement and she and Daisy together presented a workshop at the Innovative Pedagogy Conference that preceded this year's ISA conference in Nashville, Tennessee. This is the first time the podcast has had both an instructor and a student together to explain a strategy for teaching and learning global politics. Our conversation covers strategies for overcoming the hurdles that too often keep students from engaging, both material that can often be depressing, and faculty members who can often be intimidating. Board games as teaching tools of global political concepts and processes, and how engaging students in non-traditional active learning techniques can achieve teaching goals that go beyond the course content faculty feel they have to cover on any particular day. So Petra Hendrickson and Daisy Lupa, welcome to The Teaching Curve. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm excited about this because you guys are the first pair that I've had where we get to explore the teacher-student relationship. It's going to be really cool. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So uh, the first question I always ask is to help people center the discussion around where your context. So I'm hoping you can tell me a little bit about uh, Northern Michigan University by telling us about the students and what uh, uh, d- describe the students at Northern Michigan. Yeah, so Northern Michigan University is a small, relatively rural um, state school in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, so in the very north of the continental United States. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Paige is doing a funny, funny hand math there. Right. Um, but our students are mostly on the lower end of the income spectrum, mostly white, mostly um, domestic students and people from relatively rural areas in Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Indiana, all that upper Midwest area of the United States. Um, I think uh, there is also a good portion of our students who are first generation students and we also have a lot of students who were veterans in the military so there are a lot of different um life experiences happening a lot of different people coming at their education at different times and my this might be their first encounter with a university or with academia and all of that at large mm-hmm. Patriot, what's your perspective on on this coming at it as an instructor as a professor at, in the political science department Yeah, so there are graduate programs on campus. The political science department has an MPA program. I teach basically exclusively undergraduates, and it's definitely an undergraduate-centered institution. The nice thing about it being relatively small, I want to say like around 6,000 students, uh, my, my my biggest class size, the intro to political science, is capped at 40. So even my big classes are pretty small. My upper level electives are usually between 15 and 20. Um, so it gives the opportunity for sort of a more intimate, right, classroom setting. So there's room to experiment. There's room to be hands-on. There's that freedom. There's definitely the opportunity for really promising students and talented students uh, like Daisy, like some other students in the program that whatever attention they want, right, they basically have access to us, not such a huge department that we're completely overwhelmed and can't, right, can't see the really promising students. Um, and so... I really appreciated the opportunity to be able to sort of collect my ducklings, right, and encourage students who are especially promising. Yeah, but Daisy, I mean, uh, and I, I, you know, I, my students are the same way. Like, there's a hurdle to get over that to get into a faculty member's office. Like, we can be intimidating. You know what I mean? And uh, those three little letters after our name, like, 
we have an aura or something. What's it take? How does a student decide to make that to, to make that leap to go in and put in the extra effort to build that relationship with a faculty member? I would say at NMU, probably the biggest hurdle is just getting over the snow drift at the front of the <laughs> office door. Because <laughs> I felt like at NMU, our professors were really accessible. It was, of course, intimidating, especially in our larger classes, which I think the largest class I had was only 100 people. But it is like it is a little bit intimidating to, you know, go up after class or find, hunt them down in their offices. But I found that most of the professors at Northern were really welcoming, really hospitable and and engaging with their students. I think students always like it when professors make themselves as down to earth as possible and as approachable as possible, like with lots of lots of jokes, lots of like not necessarily. I, I know pop culture can be difficult sometimes, but trying to get engaged with what students are thinking about, even if it's just something as simple as something going on in the local community, which I think is really easy for a lot of politics professors. Um, and really like just making yourself seem as, as normal as possible, as non-threatening as possible. Yeah. Right. Petra, how does that develop? Like um, what made you decide that in your classes like this, you were gonna do active learning, you were gonna go the extra mile to help the students really connect with the material? So when I was in college, so Indiana State, for me, it's a school that like NMU feels a lot like Indiana State felt, right? So like kind of small state school had these sort of like, let's say older, more distinguished cousin universities that a lot of people might have wanted to go to more, but ended up like at Indiana State for me, right? Ended up at NMU, maybe for some students here. And I had, I think, a pretty traditional college experience, like heavy focus on lecture, right? Some focus on discussion. And that was fine. I liked all my classes. I liked all my professors. But a lot of it was just thinking about like, okay, but like what would make like what would be political science except funner, right? And so like thinking about like what would I have liked above and beyond what I had, which I liked. Like what would I have liked as a student? What would have been mm. fun? And so like board games are fun. Is there a way to do board games in the classroom or uh, debating or like these activities that can be fun can also be scary and intimidating but like is there a way to make them useful so that students feel more invested so one of my classes in college did a simulation camp david accord baby all i know is that i was jimmy carter and i brought in ginger ale and peanuts for everyone like that <laughs> that is my memory of that class right so that professor dr mike chambers still at indiana state would be very sad that, that was all i remember from that class but that really like struck a chord. Like I was invested in being Jimmy Carter, right? And so I know that sort of being able to get your hands on the content makes it more real and makes it more mm. memorable. And so I try to think of ways to make the content memorable. So this is not the focus of this podcast, but I've also used simulations a lot, right? Like let students sort of be the content. Um, and so active learning in general is just a way to make it more alive because I think political science history too, like has sort of this reputation to be like fusty and like, like moldery, right? Mm -hmm. Like back rooms, smoky, like, right? Like smoke filled arenas, but it doesn't have to be right. It can be vibrant. It can be exciting. It can be current and contemporary. Um, and so I want to make basically just that I want the content to feel real and approachable to students and a way to do that is to sort of let them be the content. Mm. Daisy, what's the hook do you think that, because I, I agree with Petra that many of my students are thinking about politics as something that is just about conflict and they, they want to stay arm's length away from it so that they don't get into conflicts and they don't, and they don't understand it. What got you over that hump? How did you come to think that politics was something worthy of your investment and your energy? Part, I think part of that Coming, coming to that understanding, seeing those other aspects of political science, where it doesn't have to be just debate and hate and getting, getting angry and upset over things. I think part of that was understanding international context more and understanding history more. Mm. Um, one, especially once I got kind of out of my American politics bubble and understanding how politics elsewhere can be so much 
like have so much more nuance or other perspectives that we don't even think about in the States. Mm. I think that that's a, a really good way to get people engaged with politics and have it both not strike so close to home and stir up assumptions they already have, but also seem very real and part of other things that they might be thinking about. Because I know all the people my age I know uh, do think about like what's going on outside the world. You know, where does their food come from? Where does the clothes they wear come from? Those are concerns on people's mind. So when mm. we when we draw politics into those things, I think it can be really enriching and engaging for students who might otherwise not be interested. One of the things that uh, you guys came to the Innovative Pedagogy Conference in Nashville to talk about is one of the ways that this happens in Patris classes. And to talk about that by the using board games as a way to get students engaged and actively learning this stuff. So can you talk a little bit about where the impetus came from for choosing board games as a teaching tool? Sure. So, uh, well, I love board games, right? And I like the idea of using something that I love, right? And there's other things that I love because I also love teaching. So harnessing these things that board game makers were already thinking about and sort of just saying like, well, yeah, don't mind if I do, right? And like trying to bring them into my classroom and especially with some of the content concepts. So when I was an undergrad, right? Intro to IR, realism, liberalism, constructivism, could not, could not wrap my head around them. Like they did not make sense. I'm like, these are all clearly wrong. Why are we talking about them? Like this, none of this is how the world works. And so for me, being able to look at risk, which I was a lonely child, I did not ever play risk as a child, like as a kid. So like finding risk, like bringing it with a group of friends. I'm like, I know that I'm the only one who hasn't played this, but can we play this? Cause I think it might illustrate some things, but I have no idea, like I have no idea I need to see. So playing Risk and watching all of these things unfold and be like, oh, like this, like this is realism and this make like this makes sense mm -hmm. to me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I played with my husband and a couple of friends, and my husband and a friend struck what he thought was a permanent alliance, and she took to be a very temporary alliance. She blew that alliance out of the water, and he's like, "What are you doing? We like we agreed, <laughs> right? So like this very friendly setting." We we're like eating Thai food and playing this game, turning into like, ah, right? Alliances are temporary only so long as they serve both parties, right? Mm -hmm. And so as someone who struggled with sort of the way that a lot of intro to IR classes are organized, right? About like around these paradigms, around these theories, like, and for me, realism was the hardest one because it was just like, it's so bleak. It's so pessimistic. Like I, I want... I want it to be different, right? Like, I don't want this to be the mm. way the, the world works, but being able to see sort of concretely, yes, if you put all your troops on a border, the people around those borders are going to freak out and, like, move their troops to that border, right? So the conflict becomes, at some point, inevitable. So I wanted to provide students, right? So I thought about things that I struggled with or, like, mm. things that I wish I had learned more or things that I wish had been covered. And I try to think of ways to save my students from those same struggles because, like, if you don't, if you don't get realism, liberalism, and constructivism, like any other higher level IR course, it's going to be very difficult because they're usually building on mm. this assumption that you understand those theories. And so, first of all, I also try not to organize my upper level classes or like just around those theories, but right, sort of save them that pain and suffering, and sort of illustrate that like it's not these theories aren't the way that the world should work. It's not the way that the world always works. But it's a way that under certain circumstances, like this is usually how things seem like they play out, right? So realism is basically a pattern. Liberalism is a pattern, right? And just helping students wrap their heads around what do all these words mean? What, like, what are all these relationships and what do they ultimately look like? Mm -hmm. So tell me more. Uh, so risk realism. Yep. What are some of the other games and how do they relate to the principles that you're trying to teach? But other games that have worked would be a dice version of the Seller's Catan. It's just called Dice Catan. Uh, it encapsulates the game like down into six dice in a little map that you could like that you fill in yourself. Mm. So you can play it alone. You can play it with basically as many people as you want. Um, I use that to illustrate development, right? So development relies on endowments, right? The rules of the dice. 
It relies on decision making. So in Catan dice, you can re-roll the dice up to three times, trying to get specific combinations mm -hmm. to build like a road or a city um, or sort of like a free resource. So endowments, right, trade-offs, there are legacy effects. So when I play Catan dice with my students, they complete two maps just from scratch. And then we play it a third time and I say, okay, like your job is to is to finish one of the maps to see if you can finish it in like the same number of turns, right? So how well they did in the past, how well their country did in the past very much affects what they're able to accomplish, right? In this sort of mm -hmm. next round. Countries can want to develop, right? Countries can be doing the right thing. Like it's not necessarily that they're all corrupt and wasting their foreign aid. Countries can want to do the right thing towards development, but it's still hard, right? If you mm -hmm. have lousy resource endowments, there's not much you can do, right? If a previous leader had great resource endowments, but blew it, right, was corrupt, embezzled, kleptocracy, didn't develop the country at all, moving forward from that is going to be hard. Mm -hmm. So again, I think just illustrating these things that it's easy to get bogged down in, right? It's easy to get bogged down in the paradigms. It's easy to get bogged down in like political economy. And so Again, sort of letting them be, right, be the content and see like, okay, I'm a benevolent dictator. I can do whatever I want with my little island. What, like, what does that look like, right? Yeah. Yeah. And do I go for high risk or do I go for low risk, but like maybe no splashy payoffs either, just slow and steady. And so these are decisions that they can make and also realize, right, because they sit around each other. Mm -hmm. They can see, right? what people around them are doing and if they're using the same strategy they can see who's more or less successful at the end so daisy how does that affect how you as a student are approaching the material yeah i think that like when done correctly it's a really a really good sneaky way um because i think when people are looking at the syllabus they're like oh yeah definitely going to show up on that day because we're mm -hmm. just going to be playing and we think of play as the opposite of work but i i do think that just with the amount of you know mental energy that you've got to exert to understand like a board game's rules sometimes that's just that's even more than you might spend just like sitting there and lecture watching the professor drone on and on trying to take notes so just by having to get students to like actively read something and like think about the mechanics of something that's already like pretty engaging and i think mm -hmm. then when we can use those to teach concepts which i think that the, all these games do pretty well um it can be a a really effective way to teach these concepts i think the only downside is sometimes students might not realize that they're being taught these concepts or even if they understand it as a struggle in the game sometimes it might take an extra step of being like you saw how this worked in mm. Dice Catan. This is the same thing happening, but, you know, example of a country here. Um, so I think that it's a, it's a really great way to get people to learn concepts as long as they can figure out how to apply it then in the lesson, which I think, I think Petra did a good job with those, those things. And I think it's also what in the feedback we heard of that people want more guidance on. So, mm-hmm. And I, I will say, right, that the number one rule of simulations is games is actually, right, that the debriefing is, is more important than, like, the thing itself. Mm -hmm. And so really, and this has, right, been hard, hard won knowledge of, like, trying and not doing very well and trying again in an iterative process, right? Uh, coming up with sort of the question prompts to help them make connections, right, is really important because otherwise you'd be like, well, we played Dice Catan in class today. It was awesome. Like, right, but development right yeah, yeah. And so uh the debriefing like is really important and like is also sort of like develops over time right as you see like what are they thinking while they're doing it versus what do i want them to be thinking while they're doing it and sort of how do we bridge that gap so if i've done it correctly they'll never actually have a just enjoyable game of Catan again because they'll be like, oh crap, this is like development, <laughs> right? So insidiously, when they play their games, I'm there, I'm in their head, right? And they're, right, these lessons are being reinforced. Learning is really taking uh, new ideas and kind of integrating it into your previous understanding of the world. And so you're taking these games that they may have even played before and saying, look at the meanings behind look at the rules as constructions of the systems by which people make 
can make choices in, in this, you know, and, and risk has certain choi- uh, r- rules and so does Catan. And, and, and those are ways in which they can kind of get that metacognitive idea that to look at normal interactions in the international context and say, what are the rules that make this make sense, right? Well, how do you take the experience then of looking at how countries interact and say, what are the rules? What are the constraints? What, why are they doing it this way? Because if they want to win, they should be doing this, this, and this, right? Right. So is there a way in which that process of self-reflection, of kind of seeing themselves analyzing the situation moves you forward, not just with the concepts of development or realism, but with their more holistic development as students? For me now, and this is partially because I have other people in my life who are really interested in games, that now when I look at games and I think about the way that games are constructed, and I also think about the way that, I guess also I've been, I've been looking at a lot of museums recently. And when I think about the ways that like museums are trying to teach things, mm-hmm. I think that having that understanding that you can learn things in more than one way might help like you realize when you are learning things and, re- and begin to learn things more mm. that after after thinking about like learning with games and that kind of thing I'm, I also might be more aware of like learning in like social interactions or like learning a like I guess how learning works like like operating something you know like like the co- like cause and effect and consequences and that kind of thing mm-hmm. is kind of like that's like that's kind of what games are I guess so I guess in thinking about that more, I've been paying more attention to those things. And so I, I think that if people are aware of, of how they're learning, it can, it could help, like, I guess, like you said, the metacognitive stuff. Tell me a little bit about how the, what the room is like as the games are going on. What's the atmosphere in there? It's just, it's a nice atmosphere because a lot of what I teach in general is just depressing stuff. I teach a genocide class. I teach international law and human rights, which is, you know, bleak. Uh, so I teach a lot of like really sad things and like upsetting things. And like, they know, like, that's my brand now. Like they know that about me. And so mm-hmm. like, they know that basically whatever class they do, like there's going to be something depressing at some point, but this is still like a more pleasant way to be confronted with these like unfortunate realities, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's not quite as like depressing. It makes sad things like more like easier, I think like to like to digest and sit with. Daisy, the whole point Our whole profession is built around you, about students. So I'm going to give you the last word on this. Tell me something about why games in the board games in the classroom, your experience with your classes that Petra was teaching, or or tell me something that we can walk away with that makes us hopeful about the ability for us to help students understand these things that we're passionate about, even though they're depressing. That's a, that's a big question. Um, I think having a, an understanding of that cause and effect relationship that you learned in the game can help cement the, an understanding of the whole complexity of the issue and the seriousness of the issue and how it's something that you, it, it makes it more understandable. If you made some stupid mistake playing your Catan game, mm-hmm. you can understand how, you know, world leaders, even though they might be much more informed than you and have a a lot of more experience, they might make that same mistake too, or that same mistake could be weaponized against something, or that could just naturally occur. And I think seeing cause and effect relationships in games can help you be more aware of the cause and effect relationships in political science and IR and everything else. Petra Hendrickson and Daisy Lupa, thank you so much for coming to be part of this and for giving us this really, well, so far in our experience in the podcast, this unique teacher-student kind of interaction about these things. You're both incredibly thoughtful about this stuff, and uh, I really appreciate you guys coming in. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Please keep an eye out for more information on a virtual Innovative Pedagogy Conference to be sponsored by ISA on Saturday, August 6, 2022 conference will take place in two different time zones to accommodate ISA members from around the world. 
The Teaching Curve podcast is made available through the ISA Professional Resource Center under the auspices of the Innovative Pedagogy Initiative. You can send feedback or suggestions for future interviews to teachingcurve at isanet.org or follow us on Twitter at teachingcurve. Thank you for joining us again on The Teaching Curve. And remember, learn something every time you teach.